Hey everybody, Patrick Connor here and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. Got a big fight this weekend, which means that number one, I'm here with my dude, Eris Pina. We're going to be talking a little bit about that, some history, but also big fight this week- weekend means that Eris Pina is doing some punch counting this weekend, bro. I am, oh. man. <laughs> I'm working the, um, I'm working the big Ryan, uh, Javante Davis, uh, Ryan Garcia fight. And, That's awesome. Yeah, man, I'm really, yeah, I'm dude. I'm really, really, really hyped about it. I'm not going to be in Vegas, unfortunately, which would have been incredible. But the fact that I get to work it, nonetheless, and millions of people will be seeing my stats is pretty. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. So if that. if people got a problem with it, they know where to go. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not any stats wrong with Ryan. I mean, yeah, whatever. I'm sure it'll be fine. But um, um, yeah, I was thinking all the years I've worked for CompuBox and I started um training with them in 2008. And then officially started working fights in 09. So what is that now? Like 15 years, more or less. Um, Damn. And all the years I worked, and I've worked a lot of really cool fights and cool events and stuff like this. This is probably the biggest one. So I'm it's, just like, it's pretty big, dude. And, uh, you know, I'd, I've seen uh, a lot of people kind of randomly, like celebrities asking about it and talking about it and stuff like that. It's kind of popped up in a few odd places and that's that's generally when like the general populace people who aren't normally boxing fans when it pops up for them Mm -hmm. that's that's usually when you know like when it's transcended that boxing sphere it's gotten to the kind of mainstream or whatever that's how you know that it's a it's a big fight and it's a big deal and that's that's what's going on this weekend between Gervonta Davis and uh, Ryan Garcia and especially when you take into account it's it's in the lightweight division Mm-hmm. And it's not a massive like uh, championship fight or anything like that. There's no undisputed tag to it or any of that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it, it's just pure stardom for the most part here. And so that's that's pretty interesting. Is there any title on the line? Does Davis have like a secondary WBA belt or something that I'm not aware of again? I mean, let me double check, but I don't think so, dude. I don't think there's any title on the line because remember there's like a, they're doing something with the weight. And- okay. And like then there's like the yeah, yeah, yeah. rehydration too. So I don't even know what's and plus I don't know that that's even really that important as long as they're in. Huh. Is this is like this is the fight that everyone's been clamoring for. This is huge. Like Both... if they're not fighting at fucking middleweight, we're okay. Exactly. You know, if they're in the realm of lightweight, we're fine. Not only that, these are the two biggest stars in the sport, bar none. Like they're huge names. Davis has cultivated himself into a massive following and a big name. Just you know, with his performances, you know what I mean? He was moved very well by um by Mayweather. Say what you want about how protected you felt he might have been in the early going, whatever, but can't deny, you know, the result of what's happened. Davis is a bona fide star. All of his fights are big money. Now he's moved into a big pay-per-view attraction. He delivers the goods too. You know, sometimes he can be a little monotonous and, you know, slow with the work rate, but when he gets going, man, you know, oh, there's always gonna be something special that's gonna happen in one of his fights. Um, Ryan Garcia the basically one of the very um probably the first fighter to really take in the social media like aspect age and like become like a massive superstar in his own right because of that you know we're talking about a kid that before he even was like featured on espn against um uh what was it velez or something jason velez or something way back i think so yeah like he was already scoring you know highlight real knockouts and everything but like at that point he was more or less going viral just on the internet for doing the, the cobra bag routine and this other stuff and being a good looking kid and having a bunch of tv boppers running around following and that is every beck and call you know what i mean so even during you know when uh garcia he was coming up in the same way it was like ryan garcia um Davis, even though he was a little bit, you know, um, ahead of them in terms of like professional build, um, Devin Haney, and then Shakur Stevenson, of course, and people have been christening them, you know, the new Kings and yada, yada, yada. Well, you got to fight each other to do that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's easy. Slow down, pump the fucking brakes here. Everybody loves doing that. Everybody's like, yeah, it's the new generation of the Kings. They tried doing that in the nineties with De La Hoya, Trinidad, Corte, and, um, I guess Whitaker. And, um they tried to do it you know and now they're trying to do it again um things are starting to move though you know what i mean like haney's gonna fight lomachenko who's hey, if they fight each other it's all good you know but haney's until such time but for the undisputed championship um defending his undisputed title against him and lomachenko's maybe you know on the back end a little bit and he's kind of a part of the old guard you know and like you know in another generation and 
Haney's trying to knock him off the stoop once and for all so he can general, uh, you know, assume he's thrown at 135 and then clamor for these big fights. Shakur Stevenson, who's already, you know, been, she's guy's a prodigy, former Olympian, has dominated his opponent so much that he's barely lost. I mean, you can count on one hand how many rounds he's probably lost as a pro. And now he's at the lightweight division now. He just moved up and he dominated that guy on ESPN just easily, you know, it was a complete whitewash. But this is the fight, though. Ryan Garcia and Tank Davis that everybody in the world has just been demanding. And these two hate each other for a minute. They've been going back and forth. Garcia has been baiting him since he first came on the scene. I want to fight Davis. I want to fight Davis. I want to fight him. I want to fight him. I want to fight him. And <laughs> Davis more or less said the same thing, but like it was just, you know, kind of like a back and forth where you knew none of us really thought this was going to come off. All right. It's being honest like that. Like we, we always held hope because you want to as, you know, boxing fans, but it's very, very, very rare to get two young undefeated guys still in their 20s, their late 20s, whatever, young middle 20s, late 20s, but still at the peak of their careers, peak of their powers, everything like that. Like you said, without any titles on the line, no marination, like craziness, they're going to fight. They finally got this together. They got to fight. It is a massive event. You cannot make anything as big as this. And I'm hard to press to remember the last one as big as it, as, as big of a, um, as a fight event, event like this. I mean, possibly uh, Mayweather Pacquiao. It's it's big stuff, dude. It's yeah. uh and especially like like we've said, especially given the weight and the lack of titles and stuff like that, that just means that they've been able to do this correctly and they've been able to guide these fighters correctly um to this point. And so I think that <clears throat> you know, there's gonna be a lot there's gonna be a lot of funky stuff said about both fighters, um, frankly, for Gervonta Davis, you know, I think that there's an entire Beyond beyond a certain age or beyond a certain kind of like, you know, era or whatever demographic, spe- mostly age, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't really seem to understand. Like, why how, why is Tank Davis a star? Like, I don't get that. How is he automatically a star? It doesn't make sense. Or a lot of people are still kind of questioning it. Like, they're still in disbelief. Like, he's just this little guy. He's this little twerp or something. You know, I see stuff like that all the time, even now. And while I don't really personally care about like the X division champion type stuff, because these days that just doesn't really like mean anything. Like Adrian Browner is like a four to five division champion. (laughs) Get out of here, dude. (laughs) Fuck, come on, get out of here. So I don't care about like, you know, tallying up how many. alone, bro. (laughs) (laughs) I I like AB. Okay. He's, he's, he's kind of toned down the heel turn, but even Uh... so, he's, he's crazy. But like, you know, I don't take I don't put much stock into the whole X division champion or whatever. I showed you. Um and and on top because a lot of his, not to cut you off, but a lot of his was secondary titles. So that kind of feeds right into what you're saying. It's yeah, it's just nonsensical. I can't somebody's gonna ask who's the blah 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 champion at like some division, and I'm kinda like, ah Mm -hmm. you know, years ago I could have told you now I don't even bother I don't even bother keeping tracks. There's so many extra champions all over the place and on top of that there's the extra portion of uh gervonta davis is not a tall guy i really don't know how much up more up in weight he could really go and be effective power wise i'm sure he carries his power just fine but it's like at some point you know you're like leaping at opposition and that's not it's not you're like john well, brown it's, dude you see him against mario barrios and that difference when he went to 140 for that one fight you know yeah it's it's His power definitely held up but like you said he's just he's tiny man yeah it's it's gonna be you're gonna be getting hit a lot more there's bigger yeah so i don't know how much how much higher in weight he really could go and be all that effective and still be you know toward the top of the division and, you know, and then on top of that, like uh, some of the other negative things that a lot of people are going to be saying and have talked about in the lead up to this fight is in Tank's personal life. It's a lot of baggage, dude. And that's oh, yeah. probably downplaying it, saying there's a lot of baggage uh, to be more frank. You know, there's a history of accusations of domestic violence. Mm-hmm. That's bad. Obviously, there's no way to shrug that off or be people being concerned about that is right and okay um oh. you know uh, i i can't speak for the guy or say anything it seems as though he 
seems like he's at the very least doing something about it in terms of addressing it in his own personal life. He definitely isn't publicly. And I think the fact that he's not publicly is like frustrating the people who want to know more and want to jump on it and shit like that. And like I said, there's been a lot of criticism of him in general and a lot of kind of disbelief. Like, how is he a star? And it's like, I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you the mechanisms of exactly how or why he's a star. Social media, I'm sure, has a lot to do with it. But just look at the numbers. He's already sold more than 10,000 tickets in multiple like different places in the country. Like It's oh, not yeah. even just, you know, he's done it in Baltimore, did it in Atlanta. It, totally. it's, it's not just like in one place. So he's already proven. In this day and age in boxing, bro. It's really hard to break out as a mega star. It like, is. I mean, you can be considered a star in the sport, you know what I mean? And have like a big fan base, but there's a difference between being a star and like a general star that like the world kind of, you know, even like if you're not a big fan of boxing, you know the name, you know what I mean? Like people, very casual people who don't follow the sport have been coming up to me at work all the time asking me about this fight. Like it's huge. Yep. Yeah. And, and so I don't seem as though I'm tiptoeing away from the domestic violence issue and not saying anything about it. I'm just going to say that there's going to be more scrutiny put toward fighters who are superstars and more on the celebrity side. And again, doesn't make it okay, but because tank seems to be doing whatever it is he's doing about it in privately and not taking it very public or what he kind of has a habit of doing, which doesn't help his cause is he'll post some shit and then delete it like fucking five minutes later, which is like, bro, just don't even fuck post it then. But since he's doing stuff like that, like pe- it's not satisfying for people because he's a star now and they want to know everything and they feel as though they're entitled to know everything about his personal life. So anyway, it, those are bad things. But a lot of, uh, you know, apart from the criticism of his personal life, the other stuff, I mean, it, it's all like kind of how you were how you were talking about how he was matched early on and stuff like that. I don't really see anything wrong with it. And I think that if you look at just about any fighter where there's money behind them, Mm -hmm. that's how they're matched at this point. You know, and matching. I think, I think it's more so as he became a bonnet, like, you know, he was getting established himself as a contender and then becoming champion against like Pedraza. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. That's when like the critiques were like, Hey man, you know, when's he going to do this? Or they want him to step up, but people also get overzealous. Like boxing fans just want their, they have fighters to fight the best immediately and stuff like that. And we're in the this day and age of, of the sport where that just doesn't happen, you know? Like, we're very blessed to get this fight happening. But in general, nah, you know, it's it's not something that usually goes down. You can't, you don't rush these things. And careers don't get rushed either. Yeah. But he well, totally. like, early on, you know, when he was featured a lot on, um, whether it be ESPN or, like, other second, like, what remember when the PBC was just putting boxing on almost every channel <laughs> about a decade ago? So Davis, you know, was a good beneficiary of that because he was featured as a young professional on a lot of those undercards, as you remember, you know, and he was scoring very, you know, um, very, very uh, impressive knockouts against either faded former world champions or other, you know, contenders or like lower end contenders or whatever, but he was being built up well. And then, yeah. And it, it's not that some of the criticism of Gervonta Davis is, you know, some of it is legitimate criticism. However, you also have to kind of take note of the fact that many of the people who early on were going, how is this PBC existing? It's, it's free type of blah, blah, blah. And the people who are now criticizing Gervonta Davis for a host of reasons, it's like the Venn diagram is basically just a circle. Yeah, <laughs> it's the same shit. It's the same fucking criticism, and generally come from the same place. But you know, yeah, it's it's also uh, the flip side of it. To be fair, is that the fact that there aren't any titles on the line and stuff like that. You know, that kind of adds to the criticism of the event, right? Because it's like, all right, well, we're talking about a fight where in in another era, this is a contender versus a contender. This is like Ray Mancini versus Bobby Chacon. And this shit just like happened. I mean, you know, I know I'm not, you know, titles yeah, aside or whatever, I know what but Absolutely. you know what I mean? And it's like, it's or just like, a fight that happens in another era. It's not some fucking mega blockbuster, blah, blah, blah. 
but whether or not people want to accept it, that's what the sport is at this point. These kinds of fights are the blockbusters. These are not the kind of fights that happen all the time. No, absolutely not. You know, you can think of fights like to use Chacon as an example again when he fought Daniel Little Red Lopez, when both of those were the hottest sensations on the West Coast, you know, and then when they get when they meet up and it was fever pitch and Lopez ends up um Lopez ends up getting knocked out spectacularly. Or remember on the on the previous show when we were talking about Carlos Arate and um, Alfonso Zamora. Both of those undefeated champions in the same division. Yeah. They had a little Z-boys. bit of rivalry going on the Z Boys. Didn't matter that they got stripped of the belts because, you know, the sanctioned bodies wanted to be bitches about it. But everybody just didn't care because you're fighting a guy who, you know, both of them had incredible knockout rec- um, knockout ratios. It was the two best guys in the division, two best of, like, generations, it seemed, and they were going to fight at their primes. Like, yep. those and were, like, the type of fights. Like, it's like you, somersaulting it right back. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. almost like using it to your advantage and saying, actually... It's uh, an indictment of the alphabet organizations. It has nothing to, you know. Because they got all salty. I mean, you know, especially back then because they rarely ever did business. The minute you wanted to go with the WBA or the WBC or something like that, that wasn't going to, you know, that wasn't going to fly. Someone was going to get stripped. Something was going to go down, whatever. It was so corrupt back then. Oh, my God. I mean, boxing's always been corrupt, but it was like the way those sanctioned bodies were just so over the top. Oh, and they would just on a whim do some shit. It was such a... Oh, I mean, I guess they still kind of do, but yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. there's so much uh, fan scrutiny via social social media now that it's like maybe a little bit more difficult to get away with. Maybe like the nerve of Leon Spinks deciding to give Muhammad Ali a rematch instead of fighting Ken Norton. Good gravy. Yeah, I know. And so they're just like, actually, Ken, here you go. Yeah, yeah. Just take it. And there's Don King in the background, Poulton Pack and Jose on the back saying, thank you. They're, you know, giving Devin Haney shit for the email thing, like same people would have been just slagging Ken Norton. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's, it's a, it is kind of an indictment of the sanctioning organizations that they're not involved with this and that this is still like a massive event and a massive, you know, uh, to do matter. regardless. Okay. You know, yeah. You don't, that. you don't need titles. You don't really need any of these organizations to make anything and the, and the fighters make the titles, you know, not the other way around, generally speaking. Um, and so that being said, though, you know, Ryan Garcia, dude, he seems to in this in in this fight, in this matchup, he seems to have uh, made I don't want to pat him on the back too hard because it's kind of just the the reality of the situation. But he seems to have made his own concessions to make this fight happen. The rehydration clause or like whatever weight stuff they were haggling about. Um, you know, and it sounds like basically, you know, there was the whole thing about, I'm not even going to say his fucking name, but the, the homeboy talk about doing a split pay-per-view with the zone forever and shit. And of course that's not at all what happened. Showtime is absolutely carrying this promotion as yeah. they should, you know, cause yeah. what the hell is the zone going to bring to this table at all? Nothing. Need to do a joint promotion. Not do, uh, no, like said, it doesn't need to be mentioned, no. but yeah. If you want, if you know this show, you know who we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you no. know, so you know who we're talking about. You yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, no. But look, you know, apart from that, though, you do, I at least I feel as though you have to give Ryan Garcia some credit for kind of just saying, fuck it, you know, because it sounded like, in my opinion, I don't know the, in, the ins and outs of the situation. I'm not going to pretend I do, but at least from, you know, visually from somebody who doesn't really have any sort of stake in this, it basically looked like Oscar De La Hoya was doing his best to sabotage this fight. Why? I have absolutely no idea. Cause he would say in some crazy shit about when they were first starting negotiations, like, you and know, you saying mm-hmm. yeah, they never came back to the negotiating table. They don't want to fight all this shit. You got 24 hours. Meet me yeah. Out. Like giving them deadlines. <laughs> And Espinoza on. was basically like, bro, I got the email right here. Talk about like, what yeah. the fuck are you talking about? Like, you know, bringing receipts. And then, and then it, it just kind of, I got the distinct feeling in that, you know, that Ryan Garcia was just like, Hey dude, make the fucking fight, you know, just oh, make the fucking absolutely. fight. And so I got to give him credit because he clearly wanted the fight and they're making it happen. And so kind of, you know, uh, flipping back over to Ryan Garcia here. Um, we've talked about tank Gar- or, uh, 
Tank Davis power. We've talked about the fact that you know, he's obviously smaller in stature and he's going to be kind of punching up a Garcia here, but he's obviously also a very skilled guy. Um, I guess if you were going to kind of break this down to like third grade level, how are you, how are you going to explain this? It's good. It's the guy with the big power versus the guy with the speed. Is that who, who uh, Garcia is in this scenario? No, man, because Ryan Garcia has some incredible power himself. We've seen him stretch. Yeah, and Tank's over. also fast. So it's yeah. like. And so, you know, I don't know, man. It's like they both, they're both explosive guys. They both have speed and they both have power. But it's the way they box is a little bit different too. Tank, I feel, you know, he moves a little bit more. Ryan, you would think he'd be more like fleet of foot, but he's kind of flat footed in the way he fights, especially, you know, he's a very come forward fighter. He's aggressive. I mean, he is. As much as he keeps his chin in the air, he is defensively responsible. He tries to be, you know what I mean? He's gotten better. I think since, you know, especially getting um, getting in there with Joe Goosen has certainly, is all it's going to do is at least help because Joe Goosen's a Hall of Fame trainer through and through. So that's good in itself. But it's going to be interesting, man, because like, you know, I suspect for the first few rounds that they're just going to be feeling each other out, especially Davis. He's not a guy that always just unless he knows he can take you out. Like we've seen him blow guys out on like Showtime and other stuff like that. But he usually he's a person that kind of takes, you know, a couple of rounds to adjust and just figure out what he has in front of him before he starts, you know, making moves. He's not a guy that throws a lot of punches. You know what I mean? He's always had a low output. Yeah. And um, that being said, he's always been good at placing his shots too. You know what I mean? Like he's an accurate yeah, guy. Yeah, very economical for sure. Very economical and accurate as opposed to being, you know, um, very active. That's kind of like Garcia, too. I think Garcia is a little bit more active than what Tank is. Most lightweights are, for that matter. But um, Ryan has to be the most defensively responsible he's ever been in his career. Like, he has to, you know, he has a tendency still to stand straight up. He doesn't really have a good inside game, as far as so we've seen so far. You know what I mean? And we have seen him get clipped. Remember when he got hit by Luke Campbell? His chin was right there. He got dropped yeah. hard. He doesn't move his head a ton. Oh, I wish he'd move oh, it a little right. bit more. And he, he kind of does a little bit of that uh, admiring his work, posing, yes. whatever you want to call yeah. it. You know, that the thing where, first of all, he's he's trying to fight in that style where he's got his lead hand down. And yeah. then it's like when you throw, he's very fast and likes to throw in combination, but also seems to throw a lot of the kind of <laughs> type of combinations. And then, you know, you can't just like linger when you do stuff like that. And especially against somebody who's a, they're both seem to kind of naturally be counter punchers, but <clears throat> excuse me, they both, I, I kind of would worry about for both of them uh, staying in there a little bit too long and getting caught by something that they didn't see. I think that if there's going to be a knockout or, you know, the start of a knockout, that that's probably what's going to start it is a shot, you know, whipping shot that the other doesn't see or something like that, because they're both very fast. They're both very powerful, explosive. And yeah, they're both going to be kind of looking to counter. Totally, totally. And, you know, with Ryan, like I just said, he keeps his head up sometimes and, you know, defensively it can be, he can get hit or potentially he is a super quick trigger too. You have to, you have to keep that in mind. Um, the knockouts that he scored, like against Romero Duno or against um, Fonseca, like that, especially the Fonseca one, that was incredible how quick that was, how he just boom with that hook with no one. If you blink, he's got you a hell of a hook, hell of a hook. And it's very fast. You know what I mean? It's, and um, Tank knows that. He's talked about it on the All Access episodes. He's mentioned it in interviews that, like, he needs to be financially responsible. He's not trying to get hit because he knows. As much as they've been talking to each other, they do respect each other. I'm sure they know they respect each other's skills because they know that, you know, they're fighting the best fighter that they fought so far in their career. Yeah, Tank's wow. just not the kind of guy that's going to tell you that before the fight, you know? Exactly. Exactly. You know what I mean? He's not going to say anything like that, but he knows what he's getting himself into with him. And yeah. he's not going to, like... So, man, I don't know. It's, I think it's going to start heating up by like the fourth round or something, you know, eventually one of them, something's going to have to give. And by that point, Tang's going to start feeling more comfortable and start opening up. And Ryan at that matter, I'm sure is going to try to open up and yeah, yeah you know, <laughs> I yeah, can't see. Know, the it's, it's tough. I, I have a tough time envisioning that myself and, you know, kind of, if I'm going to be fair and try to pick apart Ryan Garcia a little bit too, um, <laughs> excuse me a lot of the criticism of ryan garcia seems to be you know he's not a he's not a real fighter he's a fake fighter he's an instagram model you know he's a he's a somebody who built 
built his name off of YouTube shorts, hitting bags and shit, you know, or doing funky gym tricks or whatever. And, you know, the funny thing is there might even be some truth to that. Like there might even be some truth to some of that, but it's like, it's not so much that that's what he built himself on. It's just that I think that as I was talking about with Tank Davis, it's like, especially when you get a fans above a certain age, like, thank goodness you and I are still like just young enough. Thank goodness that we're not just total fucking old ass, like bitches who don't understand the world. Thankfully, we'll be there soon enough. Don't don't get me wrong, but we're not there I yet. Say, I say, I say, two to three years, man. We'll be at that. Point. Oh yeah, it could be like two to three days. I'm gonna be out of it. But like, <laughs> you know, fucking. Uh, I, I think uh, people, especially above a certain age, don't understand that Ryan Garcia. It's not that he's like made by this. It's this is what he grew up in, dude. You know, like you you get human beings who grew up post like 2004, 2005. And so that's social media was here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we remember what, what life was like before that, obviously. So to us, it's strange when we see these young fucking whippersnappers with this newfangled bullshit that like, and so this is what they've been raised in though, dude. That's what that's what people are going to have to understand with Jake Paul shit, too. That's why they're like, oh, this is some fucking shit. We did boxing never. And it's like, no, it's the exact same thing boxing was doing before. Just the updated technological version of it. Yeah. That's what we're talking about here with Ryan Garcia. And that's not to say that he doesn't deserve any criticism. You know, he's he's kind of a fucking weird goofball. You know, <laughs> like he says some awkward. Uh, things. Yeah, he is. he's kind of a he's kind of a doofus in some ways, but like in a good way. Like, he's yeah, he doesn't seem to mean any harm or anything. Yeah. But, but he's still a kid. He's literally still a kid, too. If you hear him talking all that, he still has like a few like mentalities of still being a kid. Can you imagine, bro? me at 19 like cameras in my face like following my every move dude oh my god are you kidding me get i'm so grateful that was not the case <clears throat> fuck yeah so <clears throat> throat> excuse throat> me throw throat> throw the kid a bone <laughs> at least in that regard but like you're totally right though because a lot of those videos he was doing putting on the internet and they were going viral early on when viral was still kind of and it was a lot of like the same, it was the heavy bag videos or it was the ones doing the Cobra bag and speed bag and this one, that. And, you know, to his credit, he used that to his advantage. He was good. He's a good looking kid, like a very good looking kid. And right. people I love him, you know, and obsessed with him right there. And he's putting in all these media things. You see him going, you know, doing the, doing all that shit and stuff like that. Sometimes doing it blindfolded and people eat that up, especially people that don't know boxing. They find that to be the coolest, you know, especially, um, People will associate that with like Floyd Mayweather type stuff. You know, Mayweather was the first to do all the crazy pad techniques and with Roger and everyone started copying that shit and all that. People, I'm sure all over the place want to start copying Ryan's um, Cobra reflex, uh, reflex back stuff. Like, you know, um, he he did that on his own, man. Like, you got to give him credit for the star he became and building that and understanding how to how to brand himself and how to use social media as opposed to a lot of fighters out there who don't. Yeah. Yeah, and and he's also had his own personal issues, obviously not nearly as severe as Javante yeah, Davis, right. but he's had his own public, you know, <laughs> like spats and personal issues that have aired and whatnot on social media himself. So he's not immune to any of that either. But right. at least in the ring, he being fair to him, he has developed and he has gotten better. Uh, there were some questions when he was kind of going through camps there and uh, seemed to be some question of his dedication or where his dedication was when he was with the Canelo camp and Eddie Reynoso and whatnot. But, um, you know, Joe Goosen is the type of guy who's not really going to allow too much nonsense in that regard. So I, I would imagine that it, it's probably a pretty good fit or else Joe Goosen would have kicked his ass out at this point. So, um, yeah, in, in that in that regard, you know, away from the social media stuff and all of that type of stuff, Ryan Garcia has developed as a fighter and he has, you know, developed into a more legitimate looking fighter and somebody who could be sold as a legitimate fighter. I think he is too. I don't mean to suggest he's not, but um, yeah, it, it did seem to be a really hard sell for a lot of people. And I think we finally reached a point where this is a, this is a legitimate, uh, you know, super fight. It's, it's a legitimate fight between two very good fighters in addition to two very popular fighters for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so my last question to you about this is, um, besides who do you think will win, 
is what do you think of Garcia foregoing um, a tune-up while Tank took one? Do you think that'll help? Do you think that's good? Do you think that was bad? What? For going what? I'm sorry. Uh, Garcia didn't take a tune-up fight, whereas Tank. Oh um... yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Nah, I mean personally, and obviously, I could just be proven wrong. <laughs> I could, you know, perhaps Ryan Garcia will win, and I'll just be wrong. But mm-hmm. I, I feel as though it's a style that. They have similar styles, but Tank has perfected the style better. Um, You mentioned earlier that Tank Davis is, you know, the kind of fighter who can give away some rounds, and he does. He gives away probably too many rounds, and he gets he can be hit. You know, he's he's not unhittable. Oh, I pieced him up that time. (laughs) There've been there've been a couple times, yeah. (laughs) There have been a couple times where he's been caught up by some opponents, at least enough, where he's a, a really good chin. Well, he, so it's far. planted enough of a seed of doubt in the haters, the <laughs> haters with a Z on the end, of course, uh, you know that that they think that that's you know the fact that he can be hit is you know or gives away rounds is that's the end of the fucking world, but um but that is an issue you know you if you if a fight does go to the cards you know giving away rounds early on that's a problem but like i said that style is something that tank davis is better at in my opinion uh he's a little bit more explosive and carries a little bit more punching power i think so i think anything that ryan garcia could have done to get better prepared for that because i just see him in a losing position at this point so anything more he could have done to get more prepared would have been better. So I think a tune-up would have been better. Um, and I think that that was also part of what I was talking about, where he kind of just bit the bullet and was like, fuck it, let's do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know who's, whose call that was, because that's also, you know... I think it might have been Ryan's, actually. Because <clears throat> I'm pretty sure most people in this camp would have been more like and prone to be saying, hey, take a tune-up. Because think about this, Pat. I would. Oh, yeah, even, like, you know, just to give you a quick example, remember when De La Hoya and Chavez were getting ready to fight each other and back it for the first time in 96, and then HBO aired a doubleheader of them fighting tune-ups. Both of them were absolute, you know, De La Hoya oh, fought. Yeah. That's the old tried and true, yeah, totally. Yeah. De La Hoya fought a completely a washed for one. Daryl Tyson, and Chavez fought, um, what was it, Scott Walker. Yeah. The dude you, you get basically a free fight. Basically, uh, you know, you could put these guys in against who the fuck ever and say yeah. it's in the it's it's in all the spirit of building up the fight between them. That's the old tried and true. Yeah, for sure. And even you, Leonard, I think in Hearn shared the same bill one time. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was on if they were in different arenas, but, but right before they fought, remember Leonard fought um Kayuli. And, yeah, I was gonna say that was Ayub Kalule and, and Hearns fought Primera or something like that. Oh, yeah, Bay is one of them guys. Something like that. Well, yeah, I mean, so I, I think that that probably would have been the smarter thing. Personally, I, I feel like that would have been the smarter thing. But it's also a possibility that if Tank Davis didn't want that to happen, I believe as I feel as though he has. So, I mean, the the issue when we're talking about and I don't want to get too much into the negotiation shit. Cause I, that that to me is kind of boring. And that, that to me is like getting a little too hardcore with it when you're arguing about fucking negotiations between fighters, especially fights that aren't even going to happen. But, um, you know, what, what we are talking about Tank Davis being able to throw his weight around a little bit more. He has receipts as far as selling fights selling yeah. you know have being a pay-per-view star he's already been on pay-per-view ryan garcia has not ryan garcia is fully affiliate, affiliated with uh a network that is not on the same level in terms of being able to brand and being able to branch out and sell as showtime is doesn't have as much experience etc so you know it's possible that tank davis was throwing his weight around here and making whatever it is this happened but regardless garcia accepted it got to give him credit you know you got to give him credit for making it happen so he, he just gave into everything and pat like i guarantee you if oscar somehow fumbled this deal which look he was going to at the end then he probably would have lost ryan because ryan probably at that point would have been so disgusted he would have done himself to try, he would have found a way to try to get out of his contract because I, like i you know, awesome. that's the one. This is your biggest star that you have in your promotion. I get it that you don't really want to risk it sometimes because he's such a, such like a precocious commodity. But it's like, 
I, you know, when they I, want, to- I just, I'm, I'm sorry, dude, and I, I'm sorry, but I just don't understand how anybody within like a quarter mile of that dude, De La Hoya, and is like, does it block his Twitter account? <laughs> how is that? How is there not like somebody looking after him? I mean, with everything going on, is there not somebody that's like Oscar? Please get help. Fuck. I don't know, man. I, I'm. We don't have to go deeper than that. I'm just saying, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I get you, bro. It's you know, Delahoyer's um, Twitter. Delahoyer's Twitter is the gift that keeps on giving. You know. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. I've been blocked on my account forever, but it, I, it was the shit talk on De La Hoya TV. <laughs> I mean, listen, I mean awesome. people are wild sometimes, man, on just random things all the he just he just doesn't care. Yeah. I kind of wish he yeah, I would kind of wish he had that fight with Victor Belfort. Peter, oh Peter. my gosh, that would have been ugly, real ugly. Woo. <laughs> oh, Triller. How I Triller miss. Fight Club. Gotta love him. If you haven't yeah. seen you're on Twitter, go to Gray, uh our, our you know, friend of the show, longtime friend of the show. Um, Gray Gray Johnson boxer at Gray's uh, Twitter page and look up and you, I think it's still probably pinned. He did a complete timeline of of Triller from their first show all the way to the very end and gave all the an- anecdotes in between. It's one of the best things you'll ever read. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because he focused on like the the wildest aspects of all the shows. So it's it's just you know because dude, it was just a circus event and just a wild shit show every time it was on well, television. I've never seen anything like that. Oh my god, <laughs> it was amazing. Got to give it credit, you know. Like, and they're still funny. they're still pushing. Different. Oh yeah. Cedric Doing tried to one show a year. That. You know, the late Cedric Kushner tried to do something kind of similar to that with Thunderbox back in the late '90s, early 2000s. But again, man, it was before you know the world wasn't ready. And I don't think the world still is ready for Triller, but you know they tried. <laughs> yeah, that's the the fire fest of boxing promotions. That's for sure, bro. It's crazy. It's still burning. It's still fucking burning. So speaking of which, man, what do, what do we think is going to happen here, dude? What's your official? semi-official pick pick uh for this fight here oh man i don't know um it's tough i i, I could I, I see a scenario of either guy winning you know what i mean i really do like i think ryan both guys are coming at their peak ryan is definitely coming in knows what this means to him he's been begging for this fight forever and we've come to this point in time that's going to happen tank same thing um even though he's a bonafide star and he's been to the big stage before this is the biggest stage of his career and i think he realized the stakes of this and what can happen if he wins this and this is like a legacy fight for him this is a legacy fight for both guys for that matter and these are the first ones that are taking a step out of the supposed kings and fighting each other this is like a big one you know what i mean this is our leonard Herbs. when you really want to think about it like this is big you know yeah. and so um i i think tank light I just, I just think so, man. I think he just, you know, mm-hmm. has the experience still, and I think if it comes to mistake making, Ryan might make one before Tank would, and Tank would be the one to capitalize on. Like Ryan would definitely capitalize on something. Tank might get dropped. I can see him definitely getting hurt and getting clipped. But like, I just think at the end of it, Ryan might just get caught with some crazy shit, you know? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good call, dude. I think that that's. I think that Tank's boxing ability might be getting a little bit underrated mm-hmm. um, in that, and not in the picks because most of the picks seem to be leaning toward Tank Davis. So obviously, in general, he's being appropriately evaluated, in my opinion. But in, uh, but I think that a lot of the, you know, he's a monster. He's, he's super hard hitting, which he is. He is a monster. He's hard hitting. But he's setting up those knockouts. They're not coming from nowhere. He's the rounds that he's not banking and the stuff that he's giving away early is generally in the spirit of fucking, you know, trying to figure out his opponent and figure out a knockout blow. And so um, he's figured them out more often than not. He's been able to figure out his opponents and the guys that he's not been able to figure out, like the only recent fighter that he didn't really figure out like that, Isaac Cruz, has kind of branched off into his own, you know, quest for stardom that seems to be going fairly well thus far. So, um, you know, that's, I, if he can continue on, I have very little doubt that they'll probably meet back up at some point in the future if if Tank stays where he is and Isaac Cruz stays where he is. 
Oh, totally, totally. So, and... I mean, you know, it's, it's, I think that it's a pretty, I think that you're pretty spot on for the most part. It's just that I think that overall Tank Davis boxing ability might be getting underrated. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I think Ryan Garcia is probably going to be first to make a big mistake. And Tank Davis is probably more likely to take to take advantage to capitalize on a mistake like that, and that capitalizing on a mistake like that for Tank Davis is more likely to end in a knockout. So, I think that that's kind of where we're at. I'd probably like Tank Davis by stoppage. Um, not that I would be happy to be wrong, but I just I'd want a good fight, you know. And I and I hope it's a back and forth fight because I do think Ryan Garcia has some has uh, a bit to offer. Oh, totally. And I, I mean, like I said, I think it might be a firefight. It's just going to take a few rounds. I'd be surprised if they run. Now, I don't, it's not going to be Hagler Hurts. You know what I mean? Um, that's just not their styles in general. Like, yeah, just, they're both counter, twitchy. Yeah. It's they're, not yeah, going to be like that. They size each other up, try to figure out what's going on. But when they start, you know, Ryan's going to start throwing that hook at some point and trying to counter him. And then Tank is going to be doing the same thing. And you're going to see some bombs get whipped at one point or another, like just grazing. And you're like, oh, shit, that would have been a knockout punch some point, one of them is going to connect, you know? Yep. And I just have to think see. that Tank will be on that land at first. But I I don't know, man. I might feel a different way by Wednesday. I just, you know what I mean? I don't, it's, and that's the beauty of this fight. That's why we're so excited about it. Because we don't really, you know, you can have a coin flip over and over and have different things and you have all these scenarios going through your head. That's what makes boxing compelling is when you have compelling fights like this. And this is what we're so hyped about, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a high-level fight. And there's a lot of stuff to talk about going in, a lot of, uh, you know, ins and outs from the tactical perspective. So a lot of arguments to be made for both guys. I I look forward to it. I'm definitely looking forward to it. And speaking of which, actually, I'll get a little plug in for them. Why not? I'm going to be watching. They sent me this awesome, fucking awesome little battery bank charger. I'm going to be watching the fight at pbv.com. So, you know. Dude, I've joined you at at uh, pbv.com before you good friends of the show, Corey, Gray, others, Tim Boxeo. There's a lot of good people that go on there. So if you're a boxing fan and you're looking for an alternative besides just watching that and you can join someone as awesome as Pat, by all means do it. No, it's it's just, it's fun. You know, like, I mean, it's, you can watch you the fight. You're watching the fight and you get to talk and do yeah. all that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. nothing that crazy. It's basically like if you've ever watched a fight and also talked in a chat room at the same time, pretty much. That's pretty much all it is. That's, I think, the main draw is that you're also with other fight fans kind of watching and stuff like that. And you can converse, which, you know, a lot of people know how to do already. But this is a, a place to do it with a reliable stream and that kind of stuff. And if you're already going to pay for the fight, I don't know. It's just another alternative. But I'll be there. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. I wish the undercard were a little bit better, but I think that that's something that like we find ourselves saying with just about any major pay-per-view. Um, and that's not to let Showtime off the hook or any of the matchmakers off the hook or whatever, because it sucks. I'd rather have a fucking, you know, like a nine fight deep card, just of bangers at one after another. That'd be awesome. But that's just not the reality of, you know, that's not the financial reality of these pay-per-views. It's not the reality as far as being able to actually get the opponents together and make these fights happen when fighters are fighting like at most four times a year. You know what I mean? So it's just not something that's going to happen very often anymore. And on top of that, when you're citing something that happened in like 1986, dude, that should happen like five times total. Stop trying to make it out like that was always happening every weekend, you guys. I love the old eras too, but stop lying, you liars. Come on. I mean, you know, I always love the uh, the nostalgia spin for Don King pay, uh, Don King pay per views. <laughs> Those are my personal favorite. So, like, we talked about it a little bit before the show, though. Like, I mean, good. Don King in the early 90s did put on a couple of bangers, all right? Can't deny, you know, you have when you have Azuma Nelson, Jeff Bennett one as the main undercard for a Tyson Ruddick, one or two, whatever it was, is huge. That's that's like a big, you know, main event in its own right. So that was pretty, that was pretty cool. All right, same thing with putting on um, Maurice Blocker, Simon Brown as like the main undercard of uh, the other Tyson Ruddick fight, and that fucking fight banged too. That was a great, great <laughs> it's like fight. a foul fest, um, fucking crazy knockout. You know, revenge on the rematches, which on paper looked like the greatest pay per view of all time, didn't really pan out that way when it actually happened. Um, I mean, you know, it, it really didn't. Like Nelson, Azuma Nelson, Jesse James Leha was good, but it wasn't like anything compelling. Julian Jackson, poor guy, got his head knocked into the nosebleed seats in one round. 
Um, Terry Norris cautiously boxed Simon Brown so he wouldn't get his head knocked back into the nosebleeds. And then shot, you know, Frankie Randall got shafted. So, yeah, whatever. But on paper, that was an incredible card. That being said, there's the nostalgia thing with people like, oh, yeah, Don King was doing this and doing that. A lot of his shows, and especially his pay-per-views, were pure shit back then, too, man. You cannot tell me that the undercard of Holyfield Tyson 2 was not one of the most atrocious undercards in boxing history. Yeah, exactly. Julio Cesar Chavez fighting a marathon runner named Larry Lacosier. Um, <laughs> Miguel Angel Gonzalez fighting some guy I named Roberto. Larry. <laughs> you remember Larry Lacosier? Yeah, Larry is from, like, Louisiana or something like that. He was balding. He wound yes. up fighting Camacho Jr. like years later. Yeah. Yeah, like, what the hell? He felt like nothing like a fighter. He was gonna, and he went the distance. Yeah. Because Chavez was fat and lazy. He didn't care and just waddled around following him. Wow. <laughs> I had literally look I hadn't heard. I hadn't thought about that dude in a long time. That's funny. Now, I'm not looking at box rec. I just know that off the top of my head because I remember watching this as a kid saying, this really sucks. That's funny. We had a black box, so it wasn't like we were paying for it. <laughs> But yeah, dude. Yeah, for good. for every one of those banger cards, there was like five not good ones, if not more. And then if you think about also like Bob Arum and the shit shows he would he was putting on the well, undercards. Yeah, if you're mad about Jake Paul, dude, <laughs> blame Bob. I mean, bro, not yeah. It's <laughs> like because look, Bob Arum and Don King are co-promoting the what was supposed to be the biggest fight of the '90s between De La Hoya and Trinidad, or one of them. You know what I mean? The fight that everybody in the world imagine if that was wasn't the tagline fight of the millennium. Yes, I think so. (laughs) And they finally get it on, and that undercard was horrible. If I remember correctly, like I think you had like uh, Vasily Giroff against like Dale Grant, no, the guy from Canada, Dale Grant or whatever his name was. Um, You had yeah, I think that's his name. Yeah, Dale Brown. Dale Brown. Yeah, 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 yeah. You were close. Yeah, Dale Brown, and then there was some, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Mia St. John was probably on there too. Butterbean might have made an appearance. Who knows? But it was just that. Those were the majority of, of Aram cards because he knew he had a banger main event, and that's what you were paying money to watch. So he'd be like, all right, yeah, I'll throw on a bullshit title fight where the guy's right. going to be guaranteed to win. Mia right. St. John and Butterbean, deal with it. Right. And, and that's, and that's also, that's also it. Like, it's not just a financial thing. It It, it is financial. I mean, obviously, because the vast majority of the money is going toward the top, but it's also just like, you're not tuning in to see the undercard. You're not tuning in to see David Morrell fight. You're not tuning in to see Gabe Rosado again, but you know, you're, I, with all due respect, I don't, think, better, huh? I don't think you're tuning in to see Gabe Rosado. But like, but I mean, you know, people tuning in to see main event, dude. So what's the point of putting all this time and effort and, you know, energy toward matching and crafting this undercard that it's, it's, it's just not really, it's not really worth it, dude. So yeah. And that's again, not to excuse it. It's just, I would love a fucking super deep card. It's just not, that's not what, that's not how they go. That's not how they go. I mean, sometimes there's been. Uh, undercards that have been solid like the the Caleb Plant um Benavides fight recently had a solid undercard that people were pretty you know excited and very happy that's about. true yeah but yeah, well and I mean I guess if we're talking like, like you were mentioning about the king card like you know a bunch of names or whatever mm-hmm. like a whole bunch of yes you're not going to get a bunch of names but I will say and we've mentioned on the show before PBC is generally very good at top to bottom matching you know yes. doing well matched fights on their cards absolutely and I agree more with that. And there's, you know, other pay-per-views throughout, like, filtered in the 2000s and stuff that really, that's gone so under the radar that people forget how good the undercards were. Like, for instance, what a, what a main event would have had Johnny Gonzalez and Israel Vasquez? Um, I want to say that, well, that had to have been one of two fights. It had to have either been Ber- uh, Pacquiao Barrera 2 or... Hopkins, right? Okay. I can't remember which. Might have been Pacquiao Barrera too. Okay. E, gosh, now I, I don't even know. But yeah, it was one of those. But I mean, oh god, I was sad because I'm a Johnny Gonzalez fan. But that was a fucking great fight. Yeah, yeah, dude, that was a wonderful fight. But I mean, you know, examples like that, or you remember? I'm sure you were hyped about this because the world was, and again, on paper and theory, it looked like it was going to be an incredible card, and then. On, 
when it panned out, it was like, meh. Um, Jose, uh, Jose Luis Castillo, Diego Corrales, too. Because oh, yeah. you had that fight, which everyone was excited about. The undercard fight with As- um, Jorge Arce against, uh, what was it, Hussein Hussein? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the rematch. rematch. That first fight was a banger. And then. Yeah, he just got clobbered. <laughs> yeah. Poor guy got mugged badly that day. And then. You know, Chico, rest in peace, same thing. So. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, he got screwed on the scale the day before and then just absolutely fucking whacked with that hook. <laughs> it was awful. Yeah. yeah, that was loud, too, because I was there, the Thomas there, and Mac. Right? Oh, yeah, dude, I was there, and we were worried because that shit almost got canceled. We were like, oh, fuck, we're in Vegas. This shit about to get canceled. And then, the, at, and then uh, the rubber match yeah. did get canceled while everyone was at Vegas. Were you at the weigh-in before that, so you saw, like, how badly he was struggling? No, we missed the weigh-in. Like we didn't. We got there after the weigh-in, and we kept hearing like people were like, "Uh, uh," be- because the story we heard was that somebody was messing with the scale, and so that uh, they that Corrales might not take the fight. And we were like, "Oh fuck!" Like we we just got here. What happened? And then yeah. it wound up being half true. Somebody was fucking with the scale. Like I think it was uh, Castillo's doctor. It wound up being his personal doctor was trying to put his toe under the scale to change that and try to go unnoticed and it did not go unnoticed so he got like banned yeah he totally got banned in nevada and she was crazy but anyway um yeah dude you know every so often there's especially on paper and you know what dude if the promoters or matchmakers put a put on a good uh card on paper and it doesn't pan out that's that shit happens you know there's nothing they can do about that but yeah generally speaking it's not something to expect especially these days from a pay-per-view card um yeah which sucks but it's normal <laughs> for sure dude i um uh, speaking of you know we're talking talking kind of just about like pay-per-views from the past you know maybe history of pay-per-view and stuff like that so looking up the history of pay-per-view i mean i some of this stuff i knew but some of this stuff i did not know so I mean, I, I felt like I knew a better, I had a better grasp of the history of pay-per-view. So when I looked it up, apparently, um, basically the very first fight ever shown in a theater in the U.S. Yeah. was Joe Lewis versus Lee Savold in 1951. Oh, wow. Okay. Like, like live. Yeah, like yeah. the first fight shown uh, on a theater television network in the U.S., the first ever drive-in theater showing a live fight was the Marciono Walcott. Uh, I guess that would have been 52, September 52. That's the first fight. God, dude. Imagine being at a fucking drive-in and seeing that wild knockout. Holy oh, shit. Man. Probably like, with your girl, too. You guys just leaning back in the truck or something like that. going. Yeah, was a bro seeing like a fucking like fifteen foot version of of Jersey Joe Walcott just get smushed. Youch. Um, that yeah. photo always looked like a cartoon. I never thought that was real. Well, that then, is, I know that's got to be one of the most famous boxing photos of all time, apart from Ollie Liston to and Neil Leifer, Leifer. Uh, you know, like all these. It was so not necessary to hit him with that little second punch off the top. I know. And he was like, "You stop, stop! He's already dead. <laughs> He's already dead." <laughs> oh man. Um. Let's see. And it was, and it was actually so. Oh, where to go? The close, the first closed circuit telecast, uh, to theater audiences was actually the 1958 fight between Ray Robinson and Carmen Basilio, which was screened at 174 outlets in 140 cities. Oh, wow. With over 360,000 people paying more than uh, $1.4 million. No, Robinson was being an asshole during those negotiations. Yeah, he probably got (laughs) a good chunk of that money. (laughs) You know he was not playing. (laughs) And then I, I, really? hmm, okay. I couldn't find a, I couldn't find verification for this, but supposedly the 1960 rematch between Floyd Patterson and Ingemar Johansson was the first ever closed circuit card that you could purchase oh, like wow. yourself. 
that's what I read, but I couldn't verify it. But I was like, wow, really? Holy fuck. So I was, I don't know. There was some tidbits in there that I was definitely not aware of. But then uh, when it comes to like pay-per-view, like at-home pay-per-view as we know it, the first ever card uh, was Leonard Hearns in 81. Interesting. Yeah. How much was this one? Uh, that I don't know. I'd have to look. But there was some sort of cable partnership uh, okay. to make that happen. And it kind of like was off and on after that but it i would imagine that the rights were probably a fucking nightmare to negotiate totally i mean you know mike trainer who was leonard's manager and advisor um was always known for being difficult at the negotiation table but that was because he had the best interests of right and the, you know they were a dynamic team together look at the results so you can't deny his influence even though if you knew you had you know if you're going in with a meeting with him you probably pack a pack of tylenols too because you just know it's gonna be a headache but like, um, yeah, you know, they were very smart in how they did that. Cause like trainer would, um, see who was the best option in terms of who could promote the event and then go with them and, you know, negotiate the fees and whatever they were going to do. Like, think about it, for instance, with like, what, like, um, Leonard's promotion with Donnie against Donnie Lalonde, you know, I was going to say, was, yeah. Promoted by Vince McMahon, Titan, Titan sports, you know, yeah, he, there were a couple of his fights that were like these little one-offs. Yeah. Where, like he'd fight in some strange location or with some different promoter or whatever, because he he could, you know, he didn't he didn't have a contract to whomever. So, and when he went with and when they, and when Titan Sports, you know, McMahon essentially WWE promoted that. Um, I think that Vince thought that was going to be his foray into boxing too, because he was already doing pay per view with you know he had Survivor Series, he had SummerSlam, WrestleMania. He, you know, pay-per-view was his baby. Like, he had, you know, he was one of the first ones that was, like, using pay-per-view all the time for all kinds of events. Yep. Where Boston was using pay-per-view, but also, too, they were still doing closed circuit, you know, and still doing other stuff like that. Network TV was still involved, HBO, whatever. So, um, it was funny. And, you know, I remember as a kid uh, watching a VHS of SummerSlam 88 and keep on, I kept on seeing clips of Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, like, they were like, what? Lalonde. I kept on saying, like, who the hell are these guys? Because like, <laughs> at that point, I was like a little kid, like a little, little kid watching wrestling. I don't know who Leonard is. I don't know who Lalonde is. Clearly, they're not they're not wrestlers. And then, as an adult, I didn't even know this. I saw this recently. Like, they actually brought Sugar Ray on um, Primetime Wrestling, which was the legendary show with Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan, where they would, you know, be on location doing different things, a lot of skits and all that. And they visited Sugar Ray at the gym. <laughs> And, you know, Gorilla was there cheering him, you know, like giving him a pep talk and Bobby was talking some shit and Leonard, just, you know, was telling him, I don't like you, blah, 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 blah. And then they got kicked out. It was funny. <laughs> it was really, really funny. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, dude. Uh, you know, Vance McMahon and WWF at the time were uh, regularly distributing or using pay-per-view to distribute mm. their product. Uh, whereas, you know, HBO still like HBO was kind of in its earlier, well, not early days, but like, you know, it, it was still kind of figuring it out. You know, they were still kind of, uh, man, going back, kind of rewinding slightly to like the Marciano times. Marciano was the first fighter that had just about all of his 1950s fights broadcast into theaters and stuff like that. And that, and the big reason for that is not because of the theaters, it was just literally the timing. We've talked about this before. We talked about, you know, TV stars from like, from back in the day and stuff like that. And a big part of it was the technology and the way the technology tied into boxing with TV developing and stuff like that. We've talked about that too, where everyone, including Marciano, thought that tv would kill boxing you know the, the proliferation of television and putting boxing on television the way we are it's going to kill club shows kind of did kinda actually <laughs> kind of yeah. fucking did but you know <laughs> yeah unfortunately rocky was kind of right in that regard but um yeah the development from there and especially through the 60s and 70s with ali and you know the way that he changed matters and i mean fuck however many people you couldn't even count how many people total watched ali fights in the 60s and 70s bro half the i mean more than half the country i think watched his rematch with sphinx on network that's, on ABC or whatever it was yeah and i 
<laughs> and I, you know, I don't want to just like clown because like it's great to see superstars and whatnot uh, these days, but it's just it's measured very differently, and yeah. we could totally see why. And of course, you know, measuring anybody against Muhammad Ali is like that's not fair, Absolutely. but but still, but you know, Ali going for the first, you know, the, for the chance to become heavyweight champion for the third time to, to be the first person to do that. Knowing that it probably was going to happen because everyone thought he just, you know, fucked up the first time and miscalculated against Sphinx. Yeah. And it's on free network television. What are you going to do? Go grocery shopping that thing? No, everybody was glued. Everybody. Yeah, are you kidding me? Of course. You know, even if you hated him, you loved him, you know, whatever. It's, you know, but yeah, it's it's amazing, you know, to see the, the way that it developed and everything until now. Uh, it's it's it is pretty amazing. And so to see the pay-per-view model and especially the way it's being used now, it's obviously different, you know, but you're going to have to get used to it, especially older fans. I know like I, I would like older days or whatever to return in some ways when it comes to boxing, when it comes to you know how often fighters fought or how often fighters, top fighters fought each other and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, we've also learned a lot as far as, you know, the dangers of boxing and also what happens to fighters financially and physically after blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's it's awesome to see the development through the years. And I'm pretty excited about this weekend, dude. I think it's going to be a good fight. I'm hyped. I'm very, very hyped, man. I mean, both of us have been longtime fans, and it's kind of hard for us now to get, like, super excited for fights, even big ones, because we've spent so many of them, you know what I mean? So when you get that general excitement of like a massive event that you're like, holy shit, it's approaching us. And you're like, woo, you know, you, you get that feeling like that, that jolt in your body. That's the one that's given me this weekend, you know, uh, enough to get us off of our asses and do a preview. I mean, exactly. you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be fun, dude. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, and also, I guess one thing I was, I forgot to say earlier, as much as I was, you know, shitting on DAZN or whatever and giving them shit for all of their stuff. I will say getting together DAZN and Showtime for this fight is once again showing that like there really shouldn't be too many excuses. And hopefully that in the future, there are going to be more pairings, you know, where that seemed impossible, Absolutely. but now they could be done. Hopefully, you know, hopefully. Totally. Totally. Yes. We'll see though. We'll fucking mm -hmm. see you bastards. Hey dude. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. I wish you luck. You better, you know, eat your stevia and fucking get, eat your ginseng and shit for <laughs> stevia. What the fuck am I talking about? You better drink your ginseng or whatever for this weekend when you're counting the punches, dude. But it'll be good I, to go. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm and I appreciate you doing the preview. When it comes down to it, a fight is still a fight. So as big an event this is, I've counted thousands of fights already. This ain't nothing new to me. <laughs> yeah, dude, for sure. But I, I still, I appreciate you. You know. Absolutely. Doing the preview with me, man. It's going to be a good time, oh, man. Thank you. Most definitely, bro. Everybody who listened into the Knuckles and Gloves podcast, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, whatever podcast platform you listened through, please subscribe and leave a little rating, comment, etc. If you watched over on YouTube, thank you so much. Go ahead, subscribe there, leave a comment. We'll either answer back or even answer back on the show or something if we can. But thank you so much. Uh, when it comes to social media, the knuckles and gloves podcast is indeed on social media like instagram facebook and twitter we're also on twitter for as long as it's still running at least for now my boy eris pina is on twitter as punch zone eris i'm there as patrick m connor come say hi eris talk soon bro have a good one everyone